friends. Today is going to be my wrap up for the month of February. <laughs> In the month of February, I read 16 books for a total of 5,769 pages. Traditionally, February is always my highest reading month. I don't know if it's because I feel like I don't have as many days to read, so I want to get in as many as possible, and then it just ends up exponentially growing more than I expected. Um, but February does tend to be a high reading month for me, so I wasn't super surprised by that, but 16 is still a lot of books, especially since I also DNF'd a book at 51%. So let's get into that first, shall we? First we will talk about our DNF, which was Circe by Madeline Miller. This book is about the goddess Circe, who I believe is actually the daughter of a titan, and it follows her life story. Um, dealing with all of the different people that she came across in Greek mythology. And I feel like for me, being someone who has always been into Greek mythology and knows their fair share of Greek mythology, I just felt like this wasn't really anything that, I don't know, it just wasn't really anything new for me. Which is fine, but it's also very dry. And I think the dryness is what kind of killed this for me. I know that there are people that absolutely love this book and that's absolutely fine. It just didn't work for me and that's okay. I then had a reread this month as well, which is my fifth reread, possibly my sixth, but I think only the fifth. And it is one of my all-time favorite books and that is A Semi-Definitive List of Worst Nightmares by Crystal Sutherland. This book follows Esther Soler and her brother Eugene and they are part of this family where everyone has one great fear in their life. Their grandfather was afraid of water, their father is agoraphobe and he is trapped in the basement, their mother is afraid of bad luck and has a gambling addiction, her brother Eugene is afraid of the dark or more accurately the things that are in the dark that are coming after him in the dark, and I believe they had a cousin that was afraid of bees who ended up falling off a cliff to his death trying to avoid a swarm of bees. Um, there was uh, there, there's a lot of people in their family that have these great fears. And the family believes that these great fears have originated from their grandfather having met death in Vietnam. Vietnam War? That sounds right. This book is a contemporary with just a little sprinkle of magic in it because the Grim Reaper, to an extent, death, is a real character. To an extent. Um, it's really up to you to decide if he's a real character or not. Or not. Um, there's, you know, things put in that kind of make you believe that it could be real, but also maybe he's just a guy. We don't really know. It's never anything expressly proven one way or the other. And I really love that about this book. Esther does not have her one great fear. She has a semi-definitive list of worst nightmares which is the list that she writes down everything that she could be afraid of and therefore she should avoid. This book starts off with Esther meeting Jonah Smallwood who is someone that she went to school with when she was younger in elementary and he left her in the lurch on Valentine's Day. She had a crush on him, he was supposed to be her Valentine and he just never came back to school and she meets him again. He's bruised on a bus stop, says that he was the victim of a violent mugging and essentially, you know, talks her out of her money and her fruit roll up and some other things. The last paragraph of the first chapter is one of my favorites and it is, so you see, the story of how Esther Soler was robbed by Jonah Smallwood is quite straightforward. The story of how she came to love Jonah Smallwood is a little bit more complicated. And this book is essentially a romance between Esther and Jonah, but it is also a story about coming to grips with your entire family really having a mental health issue and that all of these things that Esther you know puts off on death are actually mental issues that the family has. It does get pretty dark. There is an attempted suicide in this book. There is um, death of a family member. There are some really dark moments in this but there's also a lot of really bright moments in this. Um, again like I said this is one of my favorite books of all time hence why we're still talking about it. I try to reread it every year, um, January, February, sometimes twice. <laughs> I just, I really love it. 
I have heard complaints that at the beginning of the book it does kind of feel like the author is just kind of using mental illness just like kind of playing off of that and I really think you do have to read the whole book to get the full extent of it because the part of the point of the book is that these things that Esther is putting off onto this magical being are really just an issue within their family line. So I, I think it is one of those things where you kind of have to read the whole thing to get the bigger picture. As you can see it is a well-loved book. Again one of my favorites. Now the rest of the books that I read this month are all new reads and we will start with the lowest rated, work our way up to the highest rated. All of my four reviews on Goodreads will be linked in the description box down below for you to peruse if you would like to do so. Otherwise, let's get to it. First is The Survivors by Jane Harper. I gave this a three out of five stars. This book follows Kieran who is I would say late 20s early 30s it may expressly state but I'm not exactly sure. Um, and he has went back home to his small town in Australia. He and his wife and his, he and his partner and his child are visiting with his parents. His father has, I believe, dementia and his mother, he's helping his mother kind of move them into uh, a facility that can help take care of him. Kieran has been living with this guilt that his elder brother, um, as well as another of his brother's friends both died in a boating accident trying to save Kieran's life and so he's had to live with that you know for the past 12 years or however long it's been. The book follows both trying to figure out what happened in the past um, with Kieran needing to be rescued as well as a murder in the present day and that is one thing that Jane Harper does really well modern day versus past like the two plot lines. I would say this is definitely my least favorite of Harper's works that I've read. Um, this was really a letdown for me. While three stars is not a bad rating for me in any means, my favorite thing about Harper's work is that she's typically able to make the atmosphere feel like another character in the book. And though this definitely has that atmospheric setting of being on this beach and it being this really um, aggressive beach with high tides and winds and and just all of these issues that it has and that it can be very dangerous. It just doesn't feel the same way as it has in her previous books. It just doesn't have that same feeling of being a central character in the book. The mystery in this was just okay. It wasn't great. The modern day, who the killer was, all of that, it just, it was okay. The reveal for who you know what had gone in the past and what had happened in the present day I think was done really bad like almost as if it was an afterthought like she got to the end of the book and then she was like well I guess we have to do the reveal of who the killer was and just like threw it down on half a page and moved on with her life and this the weird thing too is like that's the end like it just it just stops like you find out who the killer was and why and that's it like normally even in a mystery, in a thriller, there will be some kind of like a wrap up or some existential talking amongst people trying to figure out, you know, the who, the why, the where of it all. No, like you find out who the killer is, kind of the why, this is what happened. Oh, something bad. Uh, okay. And then they walk off into the sunset hand in hand together. Like, yeah, I, this, this wasn't it. This wasn't it. The next three we're going to talk about together, even though they have different ratings, just roll with me on this one. It is the Shades of London trilogy by Maureen Johnson. They are The Name of the Star, The Madness Underneath, and The Shadow Cabinet. I gave these uh, 3.75, 3.75, and 3.25 out of five stars. Let's chat. This series is about Rory DeVoe, who is a Southern American teenager who goes to a boarding school in London. And once she is there, she, you know, is getting acclimated to life in London. And there's a murderer. And this murderer has been seen on video. Scratch that. They've not been seen on video. The death is there, but the murderer isn't there. And come to find out that uh, actually Rory can see ghosts. And it's possible that ghosts are the perpetrators behind these murders that are happening. And this series follows Rory trying to figure out, you know, how she can see ghosts, why she can see ghosts, what the ghosts want from her, if they want anything at all. 
and actually involves at some point a cult, um, some secret government organizations. There's a lot of things going on and I enjoyed it. I liked learning about the shades, which is what they, which is what they call the ghosts, how they get to be a shade and, and why and what you can do about it. I did like the mystery of the first book and trying to figure out why the killer was killing people. That was interesting. Um, it all felt very early 2000s YA, which is a valid life choice, but not my most favorite thing to read. So that's kind of why, especially the third book was like a 3.25. Still, again, great ratings for me. But, you know, the first book, she kind of starts off describing herself in a mirror. I mean, quintessential early 2000s, which these are written in the 2010s. So a little behind the times, but fine. I did really enjoy my overall reading experience of these three books. I mean, I read them fairly quickly, um, so I was enjoying my time. I do feel like the plot development could have moved forward a little bit better and there could have been some tightening of the plot. I did enjoy the characters. I liked how they all worked together. Um, there is supposed to be a fourth book. So I know I said the Shades of London trilogy. It's not a trilogy. I'm just holding three books. Um, it's a four book series, but the fourth book has not been published. And it's been about six years since the third book came out. So looking through some of the comments on Goodreads, it appears that in late 2020 someone did ask Maureen if she is continue, planning to continue the series and she said that it is coming but she doesn't know when. And part of me wonders if the plot just being all over the place is part of the reason why she's struggling to get it out. I know that there are other series that she's done like the Truly Devious series um, went from being a trilogy to now there's a fourth book. Um, I know that she was publishing that. There are some other things that she's published in the meantime. So I, I don't know if, um, if it's just because she's busy on other things or if she's struggling getting it all wrapped up because of how all over the place this is. Um, but I would be interested in reading the fourth book if and when it does come out. Similarly, I also read Asylum and Sanctum by Madeline Rue. These are books one and two of the Asylum trilogy. I gave these a three and a 3.5 out of five stars. I have read the third book, but that's going to be for merch. This series follows Dan Crawford, who is a 16 year old going to like this summer college campus thing where you can learn more things and get, you know, to partake in the college experience before college um, to help you decide, you know, what level of profession you want to go into, yada, yada, yada. And once he gets there, he meets Abby, who is a girl that he has a crush on, and Jordan, who is her gay friend that she met on the way there. And these three create a trio that are just kind of like snooping around, seeing what's going on, trying to have a fun time. They are also all highly intelligent. There is kind of a ghost story of this college campus that they're in, actually used to be an asylum, and they find the basements where all of the things from the asylum have been kept. And Dan starts hearing voices, starts uh, hearing things, begins to just get like really creepy feelings, things are happening to him. And the book series just kind of follows him trying to figure out what's going on. This is a found photo type book. If you are familiar with probably the more popular Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. Um, the thing is, is that I really don't like the found photos in these. I think they're very childish. I don't like the way they're done. Um, they just don't, I, I'm just, I don't, I didn't like them. They're not visually pleasing in any way. Just not my taste. Um, the book series overall, the books overall are very creepy. I did love like that creep factor. They're very spooky. So that part of it I did enjoy. And I did like how the characters progress. I liked book two more. Um, because of the way that it explained what happened in book one as well as what happened in book two. Book one leaves you with some questions. Book two leaves you with some questions too, but it gave you some answers from what happened in book one. And I definitely felt more comfortable with what had happened. I don't know that if I had been reading them as they had been published that I would have felt fulfilled after book one. I definitely would have been like, all right, this feels like part of a story. And I feel like reading both of these together definitely felt more like an overall full story. I did enjoy them as I said a 3 and a 3.5. I did continue on to read the third book in the series and we'll talk about that one after March. We then have The Devouring Grey by Christine Lynn Herman. I gave this a 3.75 out of 5 stars and this book is set in a small town where there are four founding families 
who all have this magic and they use that magic to protect the villagers from this monster that lives in the gray. One of the founding families has kind of moved away and has been gone for several decades supposedly and this book starts off at that fourth family moving back home and just kind of everything that you know tussles up after the fact. I had an amazing reading experience with this book. Like it's one of those books where I had a great time reading it but the characters and the plot were just okay. There wasn't anything like stand out, fantastic, it didn't blow me away, it was just okay but I enjoyed my time reading it and that's why I rate the way that I do, that's why I have a rating scale because this book probably would have rated a lot lower had I not enjoyed it so much. I think this could have benefited more from world, more world building and a bigger magic system or just a better explained magic system. We'll talk about the second book here in a little bit. I did enjoy the atmosphere and I did have a really good time reading it. I, I did feel like the characters just could have been a little better flushed out. I don't know where I was at with that because Nana came in with the dogs so uh, we'll just start with the next book. I then read The Little Prince by Antoine de saint Ex. Superi by a French dude. I gave this a four out of five stars. It is a very short book, debatably a children's book, debatably a classic. Follows a man who encounters a little prince and the little prince tells him about his journeys around the universe. I listened to the full cast audiobook that's narrated by Richard Gere and I really enjoyed it. I think it was done very well. Um, I liked the humor and the heart of this book. I enjoyed how the little prince thinks about adults and he thinks that like adults are just all a bunch of sticks in the mud and um, it's sad at the end and uh, I, I did really enjoy it. Um, I needed something for my Avengers Initiative reading challenge that was a translated work and I picked this up in a library sale a really long time ago. I decided to read this. We then have House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski. I gave this a four out of five stars. This book, well first off it's a behemoth. This is a weapon. As J.D. Ray Reed says, a weapon of a book. Um, this is a mixed media, multi-story, random, crazy, upside down, inside out, crooked, backwards, need a mirror, um, different colored writing, notes, subplots, footnotes, um, appendices upon appendices upon appendices of book. It is 700 pages of crazy. The main story is a haunted house story essentially. Um, there's a family, they move into a house, this weird room appears that wasn't there, and then a weird doorway appears that wasn't there, and inside this doorway there is this unchartable space that is bigger than it is humanly possible and continues to change upon its own. And that is the story inside the story. And then you get a story on the outside layer that is a guy who is reading someone's account of these videos that they found that was of this family that were in the house and you're getting his life story and it's just multiple stories of on stories and it's it's insane basically um i have a lot of feelings about this book it is probably the most unique reading experience that i have ever had um, I was on a live show with Julie from Pages and Pens and Amber McManus where we talked a lot about this book and I will link that in the description box down below. Um, if you are interested in reading this, this is the March book I do believe for uh, Kayla at Books and Lala's Literally Dead Book Club. Um, so I'm interested to see how everyone felt about it and is going to talk about it in that. I think this is a book that definitely, you know, needs multiple reads to really grasp the concept of. There are message boards, discussion boards on the internet that just deep dive into this thing. Like you can be, your whole life can be consumed by this book. I've chosen to set it down for a while. Um, probably, I'm probably gonna take a couple of years and then try it again and see what I pick up on a second round that I didn't pick up the first time. Cause as I said, it is a, it's, it's an experience y'all. I should note that in that book, there is no woman put in a good light at all. They're all either psychotic or cheaters or whores or sluts or drug addicts or uh, there's pages where they are basically listed out by their profession and their past sexual trauma 
it is not a kind book to women. Um, so if that's an issue for you, I, I would skip it. But I do think that there is a purpose behind that. And I think it's one of those things that you really have to discuss with people who have read the book multiple times um, to kind of get that purpose. So uh, it, it's questionable and I completely understand why there are people that absolutely hate this book and think it's trash. I get that. That's a valid choice. Um, valid opinion. I chose to look at it a little differently and I may not feel that way when I read it again the next time, but I, I did enjoy the experience. We then have Goddess in the Machine by Laura Beth Johnson. I gave this a four out of five stars as well. This book follows Andra who is cryogenically frozen along with her family. They are supposed to be flown from Earth to this other planet where they will be given this new life, this new beginning, and it's supposed to be a 100 year sleep. And instead of waking up in 100 years on a new planet with her family, Andra wakes up in 2000 years and knows no one. No one's left that she knew, that nothing is familiar to her. And she, you know, is understandably concerned. The person who woke her from her sleep is Jade. He is a prince who has been tossed out on his heels. And he is looking for the goddess as Andra is known because he wants to use her to get himself back into his village. There were three goddesses. Andra is the third. So there were three people left in their cryogenic sleep and people considered them to be goddesses because they were never aging, never changing in this frozen sleep. This civilization is has done kind of what we did during the Dark Ages. They've regressed in technology and a lot of things that are technological that are still around people view as magic because they don't understand how it works. They just don't have the science capabilities to understand. This book follows Andrew trying to figure out how to use the resources she has at her disposal to get to where her family is or to get back to Earth, not to where her family is because her family's dead, but to get back to Earth so that she can at least, you know, maybe find something that is familiar to her. And Jade trying to figure out how to get himself seated upon the throne of this kingdom because his mother's last dying wish was for him to, you know, keep the kingdom from his brother, his half-brother, mind you. There are some serious plot twists in this book, like some serious plot twists. There's one in the middle that I guessed. There's two at the end. That threw me for a fucking loop. Like your girl was just sitting here reading this book, yada, 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 blah, blah. I'm sorry, they what? They what? Y'all, some serious plot twists. Things I was not expecting. This is a very sci-fi drama. Like there's a lot of political intrigue and just all the drama. Um, there's like a little bit of an Andra Shade possible romance. Like it's a will they won't they for sure. And at the end you're still really not sure what's going to happen with them. There are some other great characters in here. Um, this book left me with a lot of questions. I will definitely be picking up the sequel when it comes out. Um, the one thing I do want to address is that this book, a lot of the negative comments that I have read um, are people discussing the language of this book. Because it is 2000 years in the future and people found that the language, it should have just been written, you know, the way that we talk, but we don't talk that way 2000 years from now. We're not going to talk that way 2000 years from now in the same way that we don't speak like they do in Shakespearean plays. Language changes over time and I don't feel like anything is unable to understand. Um, they use like neg for no or they ask if someone is evens, if they're asking if someone is okay. They will say firm instead of yes. I would say probably 10 phrases that are just a little off from the way that we say it now. And I don't think it's hard to understand. I think like the first couple of paragraphs where you hear Jade talking in what they call high goddess are kind of confusing. But after the first couple of paragraphs, it's, it's just, done so well that you just it just flows into your brain and your brain knows exactly what they're saying. Um, so yeah, I do feel like for a couple of paragraphs, it can be confusing. But after that, it's just normal. I never had a problem with it after that. I think it just my brain just had adjusted to it and we moved on with life. So if that aspect of it worries you because you have read that in um, some reviews, 
Yeah, I don't think it's that big of an issue. I said we would talk about it later. The Deck of Omens by Christine Lynn Herman. I gave this a 4.25 out of 5 stars. This is the sequel to the previously aforementioned The Devouring Grey. So I'm not going to tell you what it's about because we already talked about that. Um, I did like this one better than the first, which happens a lot in magical duologies. I do feel like you get more of the magic and the world building in the second book versus the first, so I do tend to like the second books in these types of series more than the first. The important things. My couple, they live. Not just like they're alive, but also the, as a couple, they live. I love how they talk about each other, how um, they discuss like they've both made changes, they've both changed together and separately and they've kind of made it so that they have made space in their life for each other. Love that. Um, there's another main couple that you see in the first book and I think their ending like really makes sense for where they were at, where they're going. I think it is perfect, perfectly done. This book definitely delved deeper into the history of the town, the history of the people, the magic system, all of that. And at the very end, there's this like lingering mystery. And it's kind of about the magic. And it's kind of done really well, in the sense that knowing what you know, when you get to that point, it's very intriguing to wonder what it may represent. I then read Perfect on Paper by Sophie Gonzalez. This was an arc that I got from NetGalley. The release date for that is March 9th, which is this week that we're on right now, but you probably will see this after that date. This book follows Darcy, who at her high school runs a kind of a, a relationship advice column out of a locker, and no one knows that it's her. She just has access to this locker. People slide in, you know, their problem with their email address and a $10 bill, and she will go home you know, look into everything. She actually looks up real big relationship advice columns and does her research and then will give them an answer back via email. Things start to go awry when one of the other students discovers who she is and decides to pay her to help him win back his ex-girlfriend. Now Darcy is bi and so she has always had a crush on her best female friend, but she also thinks that this guy is kind of cute, even if he is kind of a pretentious dick who's blackmailing her. I mean, semantics. This book was a lot funnier than I was expecting. I don't know what I was really expecting, but it was a lot funnier than I expected. Um, Darcy's humor is, is very much my humor, so I really enjoyed that. There were some really great couples in this. I think the way that people kind of paired off worked out great for me. That being said, I do feel like the plot relied heavily upon these relationships. I don't, I mean, there was some other plot devices, but I do feel like the plot could have been just a little more. There could have been a little something else in there. And while I don't have experience dealing with the hate and the, just the bullshit that people who are bisexual have to deal with, I do want to mention that there is a scene in this group that the kids are all in called the Queer and Questioning Club. And I was sobbing. Like it's at the end, endish of the book, the last quarter of the book. There's been some huge things going on. You know, Darcy's kind of on the outs of everything with everyone. And even the people in the club all kind of, you know, have this kind of hate for her. And she says something about to the extent of, you know, being bisexual is so hard because if you're with someone of the same gender, then everyone just says you're gay. And if you're with someone of a different gender, then you're straight. And people will say things like, oh, you're turning straight or, oh, you know, you don't count as being bisexual because you're dating someone of the opposite sex. And that's just not true. And in this scene, it really talks about I'm getting emotional thinking about it. I was sobbing while reading it and I'm getting emotional right now thinking about it because I, again, while I don't have experience with that, I think about like my friends who have had experience with that, that there's this book that teenagers can read and can get that understanding. And you know, the people in this club who are, even though they're, you know, kind of pissed at Darcy are like, no, we get it. You're absolutely right. Like, we're sorry if we ever made you feel that way. We're sorry if there are people that make you feel like that. Like you are who you are. You are always bisexual regardless of who you're with. It was so well done. Again, crying. I was sobbing 
reading this book, um, reading this scene in particular. As I said, the book's a lot funnier than I was expecting, but also I was sobbing. So that particular scene is done so well, like so well. And I, I hope that many bisexual teens get to read that and get to know that, you know, who you're dating does not define what your sexual orientation is. Because if it did, we would all be a little fucked up more than we already are. An important thing that you should know. I really enjoyed the book. I highly recommend it. It's, it's one of the ones that I was very happy to have an arc of, even though it wasn't something that I had necessarily been looking forward to. It was one that NetGalley sent me an email for. Um, there was a group of like three, they might be Wednesday books titles, you know how meal Wednesday books are. There's another one we're going to talk about here in a minute that also made me sob. So should I have accepted all three of those? Probably not. Am I glad I did? Absolutely. I then read Slay by Brittany Morris. I gave this a 4.5 out of 5 stars. I read this for the Avengers Initiative Reading Challenge. This was our group book for February. Um, I'm really glad I did because I did really enjoy it. This book follows Kira who is I believe 17. 17 and she is a game developer. She has developed this entire game that is for blacks only. It is set up in this world where, you know, they can go, they can create their own lives there, they can be free to not have to deal with all the bullshit and drama that blacks have to deal with in, you know, a mostly white predominant video game world. I'm not someone who is familiar with games outside of like Mario Kart. That's my level of, of video game. But I do grasp the concept and I do understand that like this is definitely something that would be amazing to have in the real world. They may. I don't know. Kira is also one of only three black students at her high school. Um, one student being her sister, the other being her boyfriend who came with her from um, a predominantly black school. No one really knows that Kira has this game. Her family doesn't know, her boyfriend doesn't know, her sister doesn't know. Like it's a secret. And something happens outside of the game where one of the players tries to use real money from someone to get fake money in the game or vice versa and they are killed. And so the media grabs a hold of this story and starts flipping out over this game that is for blacks only which means it's racist and because they're excluding other races my eye still itches from where i was crying during the last book we were talking about my favorite is there's a um what is what is it's a a black rights activist who's a middle-aged white dude and uh you know on the news talking about how emerald this guy who created this game he is He's responsible for this murder and he's just training people, he's training black people to be murderers and rapists and they're all gonna kill us all and blah blah blah. It's a hot mess. Um, and basically Kira has to come to grips with trying to figure out how to protect herself, protect her people inside the game and protect you know the world that she has built for herself because everyone is trying to tear it down. I really liked this book. I think I might have liked it better than some of the other people who read it um, in the group but I did really enjoy it. This is definitely more of a hard-hitting book. Uh, I enjoyed the characters. I feel like they were fully fleshed out. They felt like real people. I think that the video game was well done but again I don't have enough uh, familiarity with it to really know if it's in, in any way accurate at all um, as to like what is possible or how games are typically played. I don't really know um, but I did really like the aspect of it. Um, I will say as with a lot of the books that we've read this month uh, there's some things that we should talk about on top of that. Um, Kira's relationship is not the best relationship. It's not a healthy relationship. You kind of learn that throughout the book so just like to keep that in mind if you are reading it. There are some things that happen between her and her boyfriend that are not healthy. Mostly gaslighting and just um, he's a misogynist and there's that. So just know that that's there going in so that you're aware of it. There are Again, some really great characters in this. Not only Kira's sister, but also a friend who is like one of her online friends who's helped her develop the game over the years. Um, she's also a really great character and I really, really enjoyed this book. Let's talk about that other arc. Amelia Unabridged by Ashley Shoemaker. It again was an arc that I got from Night Alley. The release date on that one was February 16th. So 
it's already out. If it sounds interesting to you, it is in the world and you can pick it up. I gave it a 4.75 out of 5 stars. This book is about Amelia who has been in love with this book series since she was a young girl um, in her early teens and she and her best friend have been in love with this book series and they learn that the the guy who wrote the series is just a couple of years older than them. In the beginning of the book kind of goes through Amelia and Jenna becoming really close and being more like sisters than being like best friends. Amelia's home life isn't great and Jenna has these two parents that really love her and care about her. They kind of just start at some point, um, the book says, you know, that they've started make, making their standard dinner reservations for four instead of three and that's when Amelia knew that she was really part of their family. Early on in the book, not a spoiler, part of the synopsis, the girls get this opportunity to meet with the author and something happens and Amelia isn't able to meet with him but Jenna does and they get into this huge fight about it and Jenna you know is getting ready to leave to go to another country to do some studying before college and on this journey she is killed in a car accident and so Amelia is never really able to get that closure because they have this big fight and then she's gone. So after Jenna's funeral, their local bookstore, which is where Amelia and Jenna actually met, calls Amelia and tells her that they have a book there for her that is from another bookstore. They don't know what the book is. They didn't open it. They just know that, you know, it was it was sent to them for her. So she goes and she opens it and it's this special edition, the 101st copy out of 100 copies um, of this special edition of the the book that they read and enjoyed when they were in their preteens. And she thinks that it's a sign from Jenna that, you know, that she was trying to, the universe was trying to tell her something, that Jenna sent it to her as a way to try to tell her something. And she's trying to figure out, you know, if it was Jenna that sent the book and try to figure out, you know, the bookstore that it came from. She calls them. They don't really answer. And she's like, you know what, I'm gonna take this summer. I have summer off before college. Um, I'm gonna drive to this city and go to that bookstore and see if I can figure out who was there. When she gets there, she does end up meeting the author of the book and things happen. This book hurt in the absolute best ways. Like, so good. It deals with so much grief, loss of a loved one, trying to figure out how to go on without a loved one in more cases than one. I cried a lot during reading this book, a lot during reading this book. You find out that Nolan, who is the author, is kind of writing through his own grief, through his own pain, through his own issues, which I'm not gonna tell you what they are because that would be a spoiler. Being a writer who has lost a best friend and used writing to deal with that grief, this book was particularly hard to read but so wonderful. Um, Amelia and Nolan are probably one of my all-time favorite contemporary YA romances. They are like one of like top tier couples for me. I just really love what they represent and what they mean to each other and why. Nolan bought her books like perfect boyfriend levels. I definitely recommend this book if you are in the right headspace to read the subject matter. As I said, if you're probably newly processing grief, probably not good for you. But if you have had to deal with it, in the past or if you've never had to deal with it. Very, very good book. Highly recommend. And the last book that we're going to talk about, which was also a fan-fucking-tastic book, is The Guilty Ones by Namina Forna. I gave this also a 4.75 out of 5 stars. This book follows Dekka who lives in a society where on the 16th birthday a girl has to have her blood drawn. If her blood is red, that means she's pure, she's perfect, she's wonderful, she's fit for marriage, and you can pawn her off on some other dude. And if her blood is gold, then it means that she is basically demon-possessed, even though she, that you thought she was perfectly fine the day before. Their families, if these girls come up with gold blood, basically murder them to get rid of them because they don't want their gold blood to taint their world. On the day that Decca is supposed to go for her bloodletting, again not a spoiler because it's on the flap copy, her blood is gold and rather than her family killing her, though not without trying, she is approached by a woman who tells her that the kingdom is looking for women with this gold blood to be warriors 
and so she goes with this woman and she goes to train to be a warrior. There are these monsters, they're there to fight the monsters and so she goes and she learns how to fight these monsters and basically her, these other girls, these monsters, and then things happen. I also received an arc of this. This is the Owlcrate box, but I had an arc of this for like a year. Why did I not read it sooner so I could scream about it to you for the last year? I don't know, but I should have because it was amazing. I loved this so much. The world building was absolutely fan-fucking-tastic. There is so much world building, so much history, so many things. I loved the magic, the people, the social commentary. I think we all are aware at this point that I love in a book a world where young women especially are basically told to behave and follow the rules of either your father and or husband and anything that you do outside of that you are a demon and you are going to be you know chained or murdered or killed or maimed or whatever's gonna happen to you something bad's gonna happen to you because you're not allowed to be outspoken and I love these girls rising up from that and just tearing down the patriarchy I love it so much I love that so much the back of this book is um are we girls or are we demons are we going to die or are we going to survive and that is one of the things that Decca says during the book is are we girls or are we demons because they're told that they're demons and it's like if we are demons let's be demons and let's take them down let's fight back they think we're demons let's show them a demon and I fucking loved that this has so much found family aspect of just these strong beautiful loving women who are there for each other who support each other who are taking care of each other and I fucking love it. I cannot wait until the follow-up to this. I don't know how long I have to wait but if it came out tomorrow that would be too long. Like I need it in my life so much. This book I will be shouting about this forever. There is a very slow burn romance in here. Very slow burn romance and I'm here for it but mostly the are we girls or are we demons? Like that's I think we've come to learn that that's a thing that I love. Did I know that? I mean I, I am very down with the patriarchy. I mean I'm a pagan. We typically are down with the patriarchy. I mean, okay but this specifically worked for me in an amazing way. Also this cover's fucking gorgeous. If I film a video and I don't say so there's that. Did it even happen? Asking for a friend. This isn't gonna happen but these are most of the books that I read this month. It's a lot. Watch out, Fitz or Merlin, whatever cat you are. I just dropped all the books on a cat. <laughs> Rude. All right, y'all, those are all of the books that I have to talk about today. I've been filming for over an hour and a half. That was a lot. So, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns about any of these books that I read, if you would like to discuss them, um, if you have anything that you think I should read based off of something that I enjoyed, please let me know in the comments down below. That is all I have for today. I post reading, writing, book, and planner related videos a couple of times a week. If you don't want to miss anything I have going in the future, make sure you hit the subscribe button down below. And until then, I will see you guys next time. Bye! Ooh, 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 ooh.